makers working, Patna produced 11,000 cakes a day. Enough to keep 200,000 Chinese addicts smoking opium for a month. To compete with the British, Americans established the Turkish opium trade. In clipper ships, they set sail from Massachusetts, bought opium in Turkey, and carried their cargo to China. They also acted as middlemen for the British in Canton. When my ancestor, my great-great-grandfather, Warren Delano, arrived in 1833, he joined a firm, Russell Sturgis and Company. Many articles of trade, but certainly a significant portion of the trade that Russell Sturgis was in, was opium. I do not pretend to justify the prosecution of the opium trade from a moral and philanthropic point of view. But as a merchant, I insist that it is a fair, honorable, and legitimate trade. I considered it right to follow the example of England, the East India Company, and the merchants to whom I had always been accustomed to look up. The Perkins, the Peabody's, the Russells, and the Lowe's. The Perkins, the Peabody's, the Russells, and the Lowe's were the first families of 19th century Boston. The money they made in the China trade helped build America, funding the railroads that took America west, endowing universities like Princeton, and paying for much of the research of Alexander Graham Bell. The China trade also established American missionaries in China. Peter Parker founded a hospital in Canton. Other missionaries, like the German Karl Gutzlaff, took a different approach. Gutzlaff served as a guide and interpreter on the Scottish opium boats of the Jardine Matheson Company. Oh, Gutzlaff. He must have been a very interesting character. Uh, he was a loner. He was ambitious. I don't doubt his Christian convictions, but he was interpreter for merchants, and he would help distribute Bibles off one side of the ship while opium went off the other side. Gutzlaff's employers were James Matheson, a Scottish financier, and William Jardine, a ship surgeon. In an early company bulletin, the Opium Circular, Jardine gushed about the financial promise of the illegal trade. If the trade is ever legalized, it will cease to become profitable from that time. The more difficulties that attend it, the better for you and for us. Jardine Matheson and their fellow traders devised a very clever scheme to smuggle their opium. From Macau, the opium traders would sail up to a deserted island called Lingtian, Solitary Nail. At Lingtian, protected by gunboats, the opium was transferred into storage ships, where it waited like groceries on a shelf for customers from Canton to claim it. On decks choking with balls of opium and silver, Chinese middlemen bought their drugs. They smuggled them back to shore in boats called fast crabs, or scrambling dragons. For the foreign merchants, there was almost no risk involved. Sales were pleasantness and remittances were peace. Transactions seemed to partake of the nature of the drug. They imparted a soothing frame of mind and no bad debts. We are not smugglers, gentlemen. It is the Chinese government, it is the Chinese officers who smuggle and connive at and encourage smuggling, not we. Whoever was responsible, there was no denying the effects, as Edward Delano discovered years later in an opium den he visited in Singapore. One man was prostrate under its effects, pale, cadaverous, and death-like in appearance. He was quite insensible to touch, for when I took his pipe from his hands, he offered no resistance, though his eyes tried to follow me. 
By 1835, over two million Chinese were addicted to opium. The lower classes took to it because they found it stimulating and kept them at work longer than the, the, the undernourished people could have coped with the kind of work, workloads they had. So opium sort of eased their pain. The upper classes were greatly affected by it in a way very much like today. It's the middle class and above, the people who had the money. The young, bright children of such families were the ones who took to it, and they destroyed the, um, the basis of that already rather thin literati class that provide the ruling elites of China. The emperor's court was extremely worried. But what did they do? Well, some people said conventionally, of course, let's just punish all the opium smugglers. The others said, let's punish both the sp smugglers and the opium eaters. A third group said... Why not legalize opium? In fact, well, the solutions they suggested were strikingly similar to the solutions uh, proffered to solve the drug problem in the United States a century later. In this film, produced in 1959, the communist government of China told its version of the opium war. <laughs> The hero of this film is an incorruptible official named Lin Zexu. The Manchu Emperor appointed Lin High Commissioner, a virtual drug czar, with the power of the empire to stop the Canton opium trade. The communists in power today have a reason for keeping the spirit of Commissioner Lin alive. From party theorists to school teachers, Lin has become an enduring symbol of the need to stand up to the corrupting influences of foreign trade. <laughs> In 1839, Commissioner Lin arrived in Canton to survey the forces he would use to stop the opium trade. The Manchu military power was basically built, like the Mongols, uh, was built on horse. They simply did not expect that the new groups of barbarians would not come from the continental border, but from the sea. Lin wanted to know more about the foreign devils who were pushing opium. <laughs> As he surveyed the Canton factories, Lin decided that the British merchants must be outlaws. The British government couldn't possibly support men like these. So here you have a macho British trader who feels limited by a condescending Chinese system. For the Chinese Mandarin, they'll say, well, who are these people? Just a bunch of real barbarians who drink and who eat and who who do all these nasty things, and who, of course, uh, smuggle opium. Lin decided to write a letter to a more cultured foreigner, the Queen of England. There is a class of evil foreigner that makes opium and brings it for sale, tempting fools to destroy themselves merely in order to reap profit. What is here forbidden to consume, your dependencies must be forbidden to manufacture. 
if you do, 